When the First World War broke out, Germany had a massive problem. The alliance between France and Russia left them totally surrounded, with only Austria-Hungary on their side. Outnumbered, it seemed that Germany's chances in a long war were slim. And yet, the German army of 1914 was still confident of victory. In August, they launched a huge enveloping attack through Belgium, smashing the Allied forces in battle after battle, putting Germany on the brink of victory. But just as Paris hoved into view, the tide of the battle, and arguably the whole war, changed. French and British forces counterattacked at the Battle of the Marne and forced the Germans back, leaving their plan for a short war in tatters. So what went wrong? Why did the German plan fail? And how close did it come to succeeding? Well, to find out, we need to take a closer look at the German plan. Germany's difficult strategic situation had been evident since the early 1900s. With the German economy unlikely to last in a long war, Field Marshal Alfred von Schlieffen, the Chief of Staff of the German Army, set out a new strategy aimed at a quick victory. It would become known as the Schlieffen Plan. Believing that Russia would take longer to mobilise than France, von Schlieffen decided that Germany should focus almost all of its resources on a decisive battle in the West. Once the French had been crushed, Germany could turn all of its forces against the Russian army. But there was a problem. France had invested in huge fortifications across its shared border with Germany. Defeating them before a Russian mobilisation would be costly, if not impossible. And so von Schlieffen settled on a risky flanking manoeuvre through the Low Countries of the Netherlands, Belgium and Luxembourg. With the bulk of their forces on the far right wing, they planned to encircle Paris and drive the remaining French forces back. Now, this plan did have risks. For one, by attacking neutral Belgium, it threatened to bring Britain into the war. And worse, if it failed, Germany would have expended vital manpower and resources it would desperately need in a fight on two fronts. Those risks led von Schlieffen's successor, Helmut von Moltke, to make changes to the plan. The German army hierarchy certainly wanted a quick victory and adopted a plan that might perhaps deliver one. But that doesn't mean that they didn't take sensible precautions. When war came, their campaign plan involved many elements predicated on a prolonged conflict. They excluded southern Holland from the path of the German offensive thrust. They protected Alsace and the Lorraine iron ore fields from French reconquest. And they placed an army corps in East Prussia to stem the anticipated Russian advance. If a quick victory was not achieved, these measures offered a sensible insurance against the difficulties of a protracted struggle. But the danger of these changes was that they made a short war even harder to deliver. Meanwhile in France, the onset of war presented the chance to settle old scores. Rather than defending their territory, the French commander-in-chief Joseph Joffre planned to launch an all-out attack of his own. First he would make a right jab into Lorraine to demonstrate to the Russians that France was honouring their alliance. And next would come a left hook on the plains of Belgium, which he believed would be a knockout blow. The French soldier was reckoned to be keen, fiery, and full of initiative. Everything had to be done to create an offensive spirit, to carry the attacking men forward. With this thinking predominant in the French army, everything was seen through the spirit of offensive lens. Anything not offensive enough was opposed. It was widely believed that the end of any future conflict with Germany would come in one huge battle, likely to be costly in human life, but decisive. On August the 4th, 1914, German forces began their attack. While a few army corps held the border with France, the bulk of the German army moved forward into Belgium, bringing Britain into the war the following day. The Schlieffen plan relied on speed, and so the Germans committed their reserves with the first and second armies on the right flank from the outset of the campaign. The following day, German forces reached the fortress town of Liège, an important railway hub. The city had to be captured to allow the swift movement of German supplies, but the town's forts were only subdued after the arrival of super heavy artillery, delaying the German advance. By now, French forces had mobilised and were ready to launch an offensive of their own. It's a common misunderstanding that the French deliberately and consciously went to war in 1914 
with soldiers wearing the classic dark blue coat and red trousers, the pantalon garons, that feature here in IWM's First World War galleries. But in fact, in July 1914, France had decided to adopt the horizon bleu that would eventually replace this traditional uniform. However, it was all too late. The speed with which the European crisis developed meant that France embarked on a modern industrial war of unprecedented scale in uniforms from the previous century. Throughout August, three French armies launched a series of attacks across the border into Germany as part of that right jab, while the remaining forces moved into Belgium and prepared to deliver the left hook. But all of these assaults were defeated within a matter of days, with terrible losses. In their attacks, there was little coordination between artillery and infantry. The direct support of the otherwise excellent French 75s wasn't suitable to the conditions of modern warfare actually encountered. Much thinking before the war had been based on the focus on infantry combat as exchanges of rifle fire, supported by direct fire from these guns. But they failed to take consideration of, or even mention, the machine gun, and the losses the French suffered were consequently appalling. On the 22nd of August 1914 alone, 21,035 French soldiers died. The tactics of the 19th century were utterly futile in the face of the weapons of modern industrial warfare. Meanwhile in Belgium, German forces continued their advance, but the Belgians put up far more resistance than expected. They fought with determination and bravery, blowing bridges and railways in the German path. Frustrated by delays, this caused German troops to take aggressive actions against civilians, which eventually escalated to acts of atrocity. The German fears of civilian resistance were almost wholly baseless, but what they believed were atrocities against their own men became a self fueling myth. Their reaction as they continued advancing through Belgium saw more and more civilian massacres. From August to October 1914, the German army intentionally executed 5,521 civilians in Belgium and 906 in France, acts seized on for propaganda purposes by the French and British. In late August, the German first and second armies finally crashed into French and British forces at the battles of Charleroi and Mons respectively. The British Expeditionary Force, or BEF, was Europe's only professional army, but they were heavily outnumbered by the German forces in front of them. After repulsing an initial attack, German heavy artillery arrived and the British were forced back. Now the Allies began a long withdrawal into France itself, known as the Great Retreat. The German steamroller seemed unstoppable, but things were about to change. In the east, Russian forces had mobilized far faster than expected. Instead of six weeks, two Russian armies invaded Germany after only 15 days. On August 25th, von Moltke had to send two army corps from France to the east to shore up the defenses. But before they could arrive, German forces won a stunning victory at the Battle of Tannenberg. The Russian threat was over for now, but those two corps would be missed in the battle to come. As the German forces got steadily weaker, French forces began to get their act together. It was now that Joff showed his qualities as a leader, and a period of savage discipline began in the French army that lasted until 1915. Those even suspected of cowardice were sometimes summarily shot without proper trial by senior commanders, while Joff took an axe to the existing corps of senior officers and sacked, demoted or transferred any who felt were inadequate. A disastrous situation had been brought under control and now France stood ready to take the offensive again. In mid-September, the Allied retreat finally came to a halt at defensive lines behind the River Marne. Joffre transferred as many troops as possible to Paris via the French railway network and formed them into a new 6th Army to defend the city. But as the Germans neared Paris, they began to face problems. There was a distinct lack of communication between the armies in the field and von Moltke in German high command. This led General von Kluck, commanding the German First Army on the vital right flank, to change his direction of advance. 
Instead of encircling Paris, he decided to pursue the French, smashing them before they had a chance to reorganise. Von Kluck thought he could stake his place in the history books, but the decision would be remembered for all the wrong reasons. French commander Joffre had been waiting for a chance to counterattack. He now held a numerical advantage over the Germans, and when he heard of von Kluck's movements, he formulated a new plan to end the German advance once and for all. Everything was now set up for a titanic clash on the River Marne. Joffre planned to focus his attack on the far right wing of the German forces. Sixth Army would move from the west, the BEF from the southwest, and the Fifth Army from the south. Meanwhile, the remaining French forces would pin down the Germans in front of them. On September 5th, French 6th Army launched their attack, taking von Kluck's 1st Army completely by surprise. The German cavalry had failed to mount any effective reconnaissance and generally had little idea where its opponents were. When the French attacked, they met German troops who had been on the march for over 30 days and were already running on empty. In the German 1st Army, the combat units were severely impacted by losses of around 50% through battle, fatigue, hunger and exhaustion. Their heavy artillery lagged far behind the main advance and the lead troops were operating far from places where supplies were being delivered by rail. All these factors ensured they did not have the force strength to add momentum at the critical time. In the face of this attack, von Kluck moved his army west to absorb the blow head on. But in doing so, he opened a 30 mile gap between himself and von Bülow's second army. The next day, the BEF and 5th French armies moved through the gap. Slowly and cautiously, they began to build a bridgehead over the Marne, threatening to cut off von Kluck entirely. It wasn't all plain sailing though. The Battle of the Marne was a massive affair, stretching from Paris in the west to Nancy in the east, with over two million men taking part. On September 7th, von Kluck's first army counterattacked towards Paris, but reinforcements arriving by taxicab allowed the French to hold their ground. Meanwhile, the biggest danger to the Allies came at the marshes of saint gond where Second Army almost broke through French lines. But the gap between the German forces had grown too large, and with British forces bearing down on them, it soon became clear that the Germans would have to retreat. The Battle of the Marne was over, and the German plan had come to nothing. By September 13th, German forces had pulled back to positions behind the River Aisne. There they began to dig the first trenches of the war. Although the Germans had succeeded in depriving their opponents of economic assets and occupied significant parts of northern France and Belgium, they now faced a long war on two fronts, blockaded by the Royal Navy. This was the one outcome that Germany had hoped to avoid. Meanwhile, France's offensive obsession was far from over. Propelled now, by a patriotic fervour to drive the invader from the nation's sacred soil, the French army's offensives of late 1914 and 1915 would continue to result in barely sustainable manpower losses and a drain on the lifeblood of the nation. Germany's short war gamble had failed. A new kind of war, total war, had begun.